Good morning. 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 You have your Bibles open to the book of Colossians. We'll be in Colossians. Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, starting verse 3, it says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have uh, to all the saints, uh, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard of. I heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew uh, the grace of God in truth. Uh, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is, your, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, and then who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. All right. So... Colossians it is one of Paul's many epistles that he's written. Now, in particular, this is one of the ones that he wrote while he was in prison. Uh, and this would have been one of his many imprisonments, but it wasn't his final imprisonment. His final imprisonment would have been uh, when, uh, around the time, roughly, when he wrote Second Timothy. And there's a few others that he wrote during that time as well. But um, <clears throat> that would have been towards uh, 67, 68. AD, roughly. I think he was put to death. It's somewhere between 68 and 69 AD is when it's, it's estimated as far as that he was, he was beheaded, that Nero had him beheaded in it at that time. His imprisonment would have been in Rome itself uh, in what's called the Mamertine prison. So he would have been basically in like the, the cold dungeon. At, in this imprisonment, he would have been in what would be, I guess, considered like a house arrest. Uh, so he had a lot more freedom. Uh, and it wasn't like, like, like being in prison when he was in Mamertine. Why in Mamertine was he was in prison. Say again? Why was he finally headed? Uh, to my knowledge, it's just Nero had him, you know, along with many other Christians that he was persecuting, just one, just killed. Um, I don't know the specifics behind the trial and all that it took place as far as to say, hey, get him killed, but he would have. So this has been like four years or five years before right then? Um, no, well, this is roughly like in the 50s. 50, uh, at least between 50, 52, 53, maybe as late as 56 AD. Uh, that's when it's guessed. Because this is written around the same time when he wrote Ephesians and uh, Philippians as well, because those were all, uh, they're called prison epistles, but basically they were written while he was in prison, uh, while he was on his house arrest, one of the many imprisonments that he had. Because right. this was, it wasn't like it was just one or two, he had multiple. Uh, when we go through Acts, we see obviously like, you know, he was at Philippi, he was in prison, and then they were released, and then further on down. And then when he went to present himself at uh, the, uh, the Feast of Jerusalem, and then he was taken, and then he appealed to Caesar. And, and then at that point, he's taken, and we see the accountings leading up to the end of the book of Acts. But then, you know, you kind of have like where it's open ended at that point. Um, he's in prison, but it's technically like a house arrest. It's it's still imprisonment, nevertheless. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't answer your question. Why, why was he beheaded? Um, I believe it was just basically Aaron wanted to kill Christians, and then he was one. Uh, but I don't have any um, as far as they don't know the specific charge. Like no, I don't have that. <clears throat> I don't know. I never bothered to look through historians' books as far as to what would have been. Uh, the case for that, um, there might be somebody that would have annotated as far as why that would be the case. Most of the martyrs books that I've read um, that give accounting of how the um, disciples were killed and the apostles themselves were killed off, um, just give that they were 
they were killed, how they were killed, but it doesn't necessarily give a reason other than just that they were they were killed. And then specifics of how. Anyways, I'm sorry. So this would have been written while he was in one of his house arrests around the same time they wrote Philippians and Colossians as well. Or excuse me, Philippians and Ephesians. And this is interesting. Paul actually never went to Colossae. Uh, the church there, here's good morning. We are in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. He specifically states, if you look through these first eight verses that we kind of read, what not kind of, we actually did read, he states, um, in verse 7 it says, As ye learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, and then who also declared unto us your, your love of the Spirit. Um, Epaphras would have been one of the many that accompanied with Paul. Now, Epaphras is believed to go to go to Acts 19. Go to Acts 19. Most of the churches that we have any kind of writing to, that we read about, and, and as far as in our New Testament, like Corinth, uh, Ephesus, uh, Philippi, uh, Thessalonica, you know, you would have like in Athens and you have in Rome. Uh, Paul actually had some first-hand personal connection, and you have an accounting of it within the book of Acts as to when he actually interacted with people there when he went into the town to preach the gospel. Uh, the only exception being is Colossae. Uh, you don't have any actually account. You don't have an accounting of uh, Paul going to Colossae itself. Uh, what you do have, though, um, We'll start, at, we'll start at verse 1, uh, Acts 19. Acts 19. So they came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, uh, Unto what then were ye baptized? And, he said, and they said unto John's baptism, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on, came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men that were about, and all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. And when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way, speaking of the, the Christian Christianity, basically, of believing on Christ, uh, before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples. So now, he, this is an ongoing thing. He's been there for three months preaching, and he's been persuading. He's actually, they have, morning. Uh, they have access to be able to go into the synagogue. Uh, it's a little different system as, as far as today uh, than what it was back then. So they had freedom. They'd be able to go ahead and go into the synagogue and then go ahead and dispute with people. And then um, you had the believers, uh, the people that you know that trusted Christ, and then they would continue on with him uh, to go back in. And, and so it wasn't like how, how we have today. But because the, you had that, that small contingent that was hardened, uh, basically bringing opposition. So he departed from them and separated disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Okay, so now you have like uh, college ministry or school ministry here. Um, and this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And then God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that um, from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs, aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits uh, went out of them. Okay, and then now you're going to have opposition come, but okay, so he continued in Ephesus for two years, um, and he preached the word of God, and it says here that. All they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Okay. So you have not just specifically Jews 
but you have, in other words, the Gentiles as well, all heard the word of the Lord. And it says specifically all they that dwelt in Asia. So what, you know, how much territory does that cover, considering where they're at? It's a lot. Yeah. There, everybody know where Ephesus is? Covering on the west coast of uh, Turkey? Yeah. What modern day is Turkey? Yeah. Uh, it's it's a big it was it would have been considered a big port city like an important city because you had a lot of commerce that would take place here. Smyrna. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Laodicea actually wasn't very far from there either. Now Colossae is a little bit removed from Ephesus. There's a mountain range. It goes east. It's still upper, uh, what would be considered up northern Turkey. Uh, I guess in the Phrygia region. And then it's closer to Laodicea, but there's a mountain range that separates it. Uh, so it's believed that Epaphras, during this time, would have come to know Christ, and then he would have been the one that had to take the. He would have been the one from Colossae, and he would have been the one that took the message that he heard, that he learned it from Paul, and then the teachings that he learned, and then took it back to his hometown. People got saved, and then now he's ministering to the people that are there. So he's you got a church basically there now as a result. And then he's the he's their pastor. Uh, that That's the indication there as far as, uh, go back to Colossians 1. So Paul himself actually never had first-hand dealings outside of the papyrus. Okay, that's, he never actually went to Colossae. Uh, but they received the word of God because of his preaching while at Ephesus. And now you have this group of folks that are over there. Now he's writing to them in particular um, for a number of reasons. One, he wants to encourage them. He says that um, he prays for them, you know, because of the um, and then he he wants he wants okay. Um, go to verse nine. Uh, for this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and for this express purpose, okay, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, you know, and then strengthen with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness, while giving thanks, or giving thanks unto the Father which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of, of the saints in light. Okay, so he wants their spiritual benefit. He wants them to grow. Uh, he wants them to be able to not only have all wisdom and spiritual understanding as far as in Christ, but he wants them to be able to be fruitful in other words, to have something with them. God expects, he's gifted them as well because the fact is every believer, anybody that comes to him in faith uh, not only will he know why he's cast out, but the fact is when he receives them, he adopts them and he gifts them in particular so that they would grow. And so that they, because God has a purpose and a plan for every person that would come to know him. And so what he does is he gifts them uh, particularly and he wants to use them and he wants it, them to, to grow and develop. But that only happens as they yield themselves to him and as that, that, that and that takes uh, proactive uh, a conscious decision on their part, uh, as well as on our part, uh, that we would um, we would seek Him, and, and that starts uh, with uh, knowledge of His will and uh, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Okay, so information that we get as far as who God is, what He's like, and what He wants, uh, we we have to make the choice to actively seek that when He gives that to us as we obey it, as we submit ourselves to it, and then what he does is he continues to guide, he continues to uh, give information in as well, and then we we are thereby blessed, and then he, he's actively working in our lives. Uh, now, he's going to address something that was an issue there, as well as other uh, in other regions that he would address as well. You see this similarly in, in uh, Galatia, when he writes the, uh, to the Church of Galatia. Uh, and that is, um, he, it's a big term, but it's, the theological term for him is called Gnosticism, but 
it's the concept or the idea that Jesus is not enough. Okay, you need to have special knowledge. You need to have a special or like a unique, or there's only like this, um, there's something beyond just Christ that you need in your, in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual life, if you're going to grow. In Galatia, it was that you need to have the law. In other words, that you add the law to faith in order to be able to be pleasing unto God. Um, and then, uh, in order, and, but here, it, it's kind of similarly as far as um, how the Calvinists would, would put it, basically. And that is, is that, you know, it's just, you know, Christ isn't enough for you. Where he addresses that in, um, in chapter 2. Uh, well, verse 6 is a summary of that. It says, As ye have therefore received Christ the Lord, um, so walk ye in him, okay, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And then beware lest any man spoil you through vain, or through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and then ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. Okay, so in other words, Christ is all you need. Christ is sufficient for your walk. Uh, you, don't, you don't need any kind of extra special revelation or any extra special knowledge or any extra special key uh, to, to be able to get close to God. Christ is all. I mean, he's, it, he's the fullness of the Godhead. You know? uh, and you're, you're completing him. That's it. You're not going to get any more. You're not going to get anything else. You come to him, and then uh, I mean, obviously, he's not going to cast you out. But the fact is, he there's there there is nowhere else to go. I mean, he's the source of all truth. Uh, he's uh, the express image of of God. Uh, we're told in Hebrews, and so they were looking at uh, yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, they were looking to Christ, but they were also looking to other things. They were looking to having this knowledge or that knowledge, or they were basically, as Paul puts it here, is uh, philosophy and vain deceit, and then uh, which are after a tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world. Okay, so the rudiments of the world, the building blocks, the ABCs of the world, says that you know you need to have this and that, and you know Jesus really is good enough, but rather Christ's teaching, God's teaching is that Christ is all you need. Um, and as a result, if you just come to him by faith and in the same way that you came to him as far as to receive salvation, is that's how you move forward. Um, we just had actually a message preached on this a few weeks ago actually, but it's, uh, it's, it seems almost kind of like covering old territory, but the thing is it's you Faith is basically trusting God is believing God, take him at his word. All right, so he says something, whatever, whatever the command is. Okay? Uh, and then what you do is you are then left with a choice whether or not I'm going to receive this as far as what he states or not. Uh, most, this is our, this is our common way of evaluating stuff. Okay, we look at it and then we say, okay, whether or not there's going to be like any kind of loss or damage to me. Uh, you know, you, you look at the person that's stating it uh, and then you, you value what, you, you evaluate, okay, are they, what, first off, are they worthy of me, uh, of my time, you know, and then two, you know, of, of my obedience to it. Okay, now we know from scripture that Faith is not by sight, okay? So, because if it were by sight, then it, you know, it would be faith. So, faith, by its very nature, is just that it's something that you don't see, but you're convinced of. Okay, this is true. Uh, and it's on the regarding God. It's on the basis of the character of the person, right? And so, in other words, God, we know, doesn't lie. So, when he when he tells us something, when he instructs us on something, when he guides us to something, when he uh, has something for us to do, um, 
we're not going to immediately see, okay, what's the outcome outside of what he had, has told us or instructs us. So there's going to be a measure of, well, I don't know how this is going to turn out. Other than the fact that you're going, you know, that you're depending on the fact, okay, hey, that this is God that's telling me. And then he, when he's given specific, you know, either instruction or when he gives specific guidance on something, uh, he will usually tell you, okay, here, uh, okay, for instance, as with the children of Israel, he told them, okay, look, I've given you um, the promised land. You know, I want you to go into it. Now, they hadn't, up to that point, prior to Joshua leading them in, gone in yet, it, with the exception of the 12 that went in to spy the land, and then they came back and they gave a report of it. Um, but God had told them specifically, prior to them even having sent in the spies, was that this is a land that's flowing with milk and honey. It, you know, this is a great, wonderful place. You know, uh, and I've given it to you. I'm going to fight for you on your behalf. So the spies go in. They come back. They actually bring back fruit from the land, and they can't really argue with the fact that God had said, "Okay, it's milk and honey. You know, it's a, it's a it's a it's a you know it's a wonderful land." You know, they <laughs> they didn't have anything negative to say about that part. Okay, where 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 they diverged that was that. God had told him, okay, also that I'm giving it to you. I'm going to fight on your behalf. This is yours. You have Caleb that's fired up and he's like, okay, hey, look, let's go in. We can take these people. It's nothing. God's given it to us. And then you have the rest beyond him and Joshua, um, the, the ten. They discourage people because they say, well, wait a minute, we can't do that. These, we're as grasshoppers in their sight. You know, these people are giants. They have walled cities. They have all these other number of things that we, we can't fight, we can't stand against. And then what they're doing is they're, uh, beyond just human rationalizing, is the fact that they're, they're saying, hey, they're, they're, they're totally discounting what God had said to them, which was the fact that I am with you and I will fight for you. In other words, I'm going to deliver them into your hands. I'm going to be the one. Now, I know it seems kind of silly comparison, but the fact is, is God bigger than a giant? Is God stronger than a giant? I mean, sure. is God more powerful than the walls that are surrounding a, a city for an area that you're going to take in? Sure. I mean, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, but... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Okay. okay and, uh, <laughs> if you sit down and think about it, it's like, wow, okay, yeah, it's dumb. But they weren't they're just thinking, they're really thinking bad about God because they're saying, oh, you know, up to that point when they would complain, uh, they would, it's basically an, an, an indictment on God's character. They're basically saying, God, you're not good enough. You brought us out here to die. You brought us out here to starve. You brought us out here to, you know, to die of thirst. You brought us out here, you know, oh, would to God that we were back in Egypt. You know, with the leeks and the onions, and what would God, you know, that we were back. And in fact, was the entire time their whole attitude and disposition, by and large, as far as the, the majority of that generation, was that, you know, God, you're not good. I want to live nice and comfortable. You know, I don't want to have to have any kind of hardship or difficulty. And then they fail to see, wait a minute, this is not. <laughs> the fact was, God, God's the one that's doing everything. You know, He's provided everything for them up to that point, He sustained them. Uh, and he's fought for them on their behalf, and he's delivered enemies. He's delivered them out of Egypt, uh, which, quite frankly, was supernatural, uh, miraculous. And even even the things leading up to their their deliverance from Egypt was incredibly supernatural. You can't argue that. Um, and so much so that that entire region was familiar with who God was, uh, though they weren't accepting believers. That, they, they, they knew all about the God of the Hebrews. There was a fear that was on that land uh, because of because of God, you know, the uh, power of God, and that, that you know God was on the behalf of the Hebrews. And so the cases with us, and quite frankly, I said uh, the cases here uh, as well with the Colossians. Okay, um, you, it's by faith. In other words, you, you're, there's going to be things that where you're going to not understand. You're not 
going to be able to rationalize in your left thinking, if I do this, I'm going to suffer damage or I'm going to suffer hurt. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about being foolish. I'm just talking about simply taking God at his word. When God states something, God instructs something, God leads or something, God gives specific direction towards something, specific command. Uh, the fact is, that's him um, stating, here's what I want. You know, and there's a promise associated with it. And I, my responsibility is obey it, basically, is what it comes down to. Um, but, and I believe him. And if I don't, um, then basically I'm, I'm going to be living by sight rather than my faith. I'm not going to be walking uh, as how he would want me to, uh, at, which, at which point I'm not going to be well-pleasing. Um, but the, the Colossian believers here were instructed, as with the others, because this is all. This is an area that isn't specifically exclusive to them, but basically, they they need to walk by faith, and that's how that's how you grow. That's in other words, it, your whole life is going to be your whole the whole of your Christian life, whether you live to be raptured or you live to a certain old age, um, and then you know you you, you die of natural causes. Um, the fact is, what, whichever way, as far as how God would have for your life, it's to be lived by faith. Uh, that that's how He's commanded. You know, and the the just shall live by faith. That's 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 the only way to be able to be well pleasing unto Him. So He addresses this with the Colossian believers, uh, trying to correct an error that has found itself in uh, that has crept in, in, into. To their church there, and then he spends the rest of the chapter, uh, excuse me, following that, um, chapters three and four, as far as how this is practically, th this is what it looks like. Uh, that, and this is going to sound like basically almost a repeat of Ephesians, uh, end of Ephesians four, going to five and six. Um, You go to you know, chapter three, okay. And then if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And then when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. And here, here's where the, the similarity is: is again, fortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And here are the members. Okay, your body parts, your parts of the things. Uh, chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, uh, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Okay, for these things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in which also you walked some time when ye lived in them. But now, are you, uh, but now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Why not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, uh, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in, in all. Okay, so our identity is supposed to be as a Christian in Christ. So I'm not looking to be, um, in other words, when he wrote to Titus, uh, he wrote to him that he wanted him to put in. Yes. Verse eight. Now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, etc. Is that a command or is that more of a saying, accommodation with regard to doing? No. He he. Uh, No, it's it's a command, so it's starting. In other words, it, so it's, it's possible for believers to do this. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. He that that's he calls out to them basically to put on a new man. Because the fact is is that um, if they're not. Then the old man's going to be going to be manifest. 
and you're called to be different because you you have a new man in you now. Okay. Does it make sense? I know where you're going. Okay. Yeah, no, it is possible for for a believer to live in that in that state or that condition. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be well pleasing to God, but it is possible. And that's also why he commands them to see, to set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Okay, because we're not. I mean, yeah, we live here. We have a responsibility here. But the fact is, uh, we're we're citizens of heaven. And as far as God's concerned, you know, this is this is temporary. You know, our real life really is up there. Okay? And that's not that. Our real life really starts when we get born again. And we should live it in light of the fact of when we transition from here to there. Because um, this, this is all going to burn. This is all temporary. So the only thing that really is of any value or any substance is that which is eternal. Okay, uh, so our identity, uh, verse 11, uh, chapter 3, uh, in Colossians. Um, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, uh, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, city, bond or free, Christ is all and in all. In other words, our identity is Christ as a Christian. So we shouldn't seek to identify ourselves as anything but. Uh, it makes sense. In other words, like, I. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a believer, I'm, I'm a Christ follower. You know, that, that's, that's where my identity lies at. That's how God sees me. And yeah, I might be a barbarian believer, or I might be a, a Colossian believer, or I'm a, what was the, the analogy I was going to use? Um, oh, when he, in Titus, when, when Paul writes to Titus, he writes to them uh, as far as that the Cretans are evil beasts, slow bellies, and liars, right? And he tells them, you know, rebuke them sharply because this witness is true. Um, so I can, if I were a Cretan, you know, it would be natural for me to be an evil beast, slow belly, and liar, uh, because that's the culture. And I could say, oh, well, you know, I'm a Christian. You know, that's that's how we are. I'm just a Christian believer. In fact, it's like, no, nah, that's what you, not, you know, you might be, but the fact is, that's not what you're called to be. That's not what God has called you. God identifies you now, since you've come to Christ as as a Christian, and you're identifying, you're you're supposed to identify with Him. All right. So whether I, you know. Uh, if I were a Christian, you know, I, I have a choice then at that point. It's like, I, I need to be ashamed of these things because even though everybody else around me accepts it and they're okay with it and they're fine, the fact is God isn't. And so I need to, I need to at that point. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. So my identity, regardless of whether or not I'm a, a Christian, um, and would be acceptable of those things in my flesh, God says no. And this is wicked. And so I, I need to identify myself as God identifies me, and that is as, as his child, as a believer, and therefore live in light of that. And that's that's his call. And then, then you know, that's he continues on with that as far as you know, uh, verse twelve. Put on therefore the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. And then, you know, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And then he goes on as far as how relationships, your interactions with others, you know, wives submitted to your own husbands, as it is in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing. You know, fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, but as men pleasers, uh, as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart. And then, you know, this is as for everybody, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord and not as unto men. Um, and then masters, you know, going into verse, uh, chapter 4, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And then, you know, continue in prayer, watching the same with thanksgiving, with all praying for us. And then guard how your speech is to be, you know, um, verse 5, you know, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt they may know how to answer every man and then he's going to finish up with a few other um, things and this is his 
conclusion where he starts addressing different people in particular. Um, but he wrote to them in particular to address that main issue. You don't need extra special knowledge. You don't have to have any um, thing to supplement Christ in your life. In other words, Christ is all. Um, Christ is all you need. Christ is sufficient for you as a believer. If you look to God, if you look to Christ, you know, then you walk in faith therefore so that you would be able to grow and be fruitful. That was his desire. Uh, ultimately, that's why he wrote to them. And then he expresses to them as far as this is what it's going to look like on a practical level when you are walking by faith and then you're putting not only the things that are above as your primary affection and mortifying, you know, but also the things that uh, that are for the here uh, of the flesh, uh, putting them to death, rendering them basically powerless. Uh, that's the mor mortification. You know, you're not going to have um, kind of like if you were uh, like at a funeral, right? And you, you're uh, if they have an open casket, if you uh, sometimes a lot of times they'll have it like in, you know the dead body in a casket in front of the church. You know, at the graveside, but usually they don't have the casket open at the graveside. Uh, but at that point, they just already close in and they get ready to put it down. Uh, but say, you know, it's in front of the church over here, you got the dead body, uh, somebody's passed, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you don't expect that thing to <coughs> sit up, you know, and then get up, you know, or to raise its hands or anything like that. You know, if somebody were to come, um, you know, start poking it, well, you know, what would it do? I mean, nothing. It's not going to be. It doesn't have the reason why it's dead. It doesn't have any. Uh, there's no power. There's no life in it. Uh, it can't. You know, it can't do anything. You know, even it wouldn't be able to speak to you. It's not going to open its eyes. Um, they, it's you know, there's <laughs> there's no power to it. And that's how we're supposed to uh, render our flesh, our body, dead unto sin, in other words, sin, that temptation, or those urges, uh, the thought of it coming in, I don't have to obey it, and it's, it's basically, it's, there's no power to it in my life. It doesn't mean that the appeal of it isn't strong, it just means I, I have a choice to say, hey, no. But rather, instead, you know, these hands, these eyes, this mouth, these ears, uh, this brain, my legs, my feet, everything is supposed to be, okay, yes, Lord, and alive unto what God has for me. So that uh, when I act on something, I'm acting on what God has rather than acting on what my flesh has or what, what the devil has for me. And the reason why is because I have a new identity because I'm in Christ now um, since I've believed. And that's what he wanted to be able to get across the Church of Colossae, and that's what he had prayed for them that they would have so that they would be fruitful and be able to be well-pleasing and stand before God to hear, well done. And that's that's why he wrote to them. Right. Does anybody have any questions? None were uh, dismissed.